This week on Wealth Track, a television exclusive with great investor Chuck Royce. This legendary small company stock fund manager explains why small is still beautiful for investors. Next on Consuelo Mac Wealth Track. The company you keep is also the company we keep. Together we help provide a lifetime of guaranteed income and investment solutions. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market, Wintergreen, your home for global value, and Rosalind P. Walter. Hello and welcome to this edition of Wealth Track. I'm Consuelo Mack. This week we have a rare treat for all of you, an exclusive television interview with investment legend Charles Chuck Royce, whose name is synonymous with small company stocks. This great value investor has specialized in small company stocks since he took over his flagship Royce Pennsylvania Mutual Fund 35 years ago. And since then, the fund has clocked an average annualized total return of nearly 15% handily beating the market with less than market volatility. Over the last three decades, the Royce & Associates Fund family has expanded to 24 microcap, small, and mid-cap value funds, 13 of which are managed or co-managed by Royce himself, and three with his assist. The so-called small-cap universe has more than come into its own in the three-plus decades since the pioneering Royce recognized its value. There are more than 3,100 U.S. companies identified as microcap with market values of up to $500 million, more than 1,100 small cap with market values between $500 million and $2.5 billion, and more than 600 companies categorized as U.S. mid-cap with stock market values between $2.5 and $15 billion. Then there are the foreign small cap stocks. By Royce's count, this market consists of more than 15,000 companies in the developed world alone. And Royce just launched three new international funds to take advantage of what he believes are exceptional opportunities overseas. Now, until very recently, small has been beautiful for investors. Small company stocks have left their larger siblings in the dust. Since the market meltdown, the Russell 2000, considered to be a proxy for American small company stocks, has skyrocketed more than 130% and has outperformed the S&P 500 over the last three, five, and 10-year periods. The downside, small company stocks come with more volatility than their large cap brethren on both the upside and the downside. Now, recently, small cap stocks have shown some vulnerability, leading many investors to say that relatively undervalued large caps will finally dominate. Chuck Royce has some definite thoughts about that. But I began by asking him why he decided to focus on small company stocks in the first place and why he has stuck with them ever since. It wasn't called small caps. It was, in those days, it was just sort of an aggressive form of money management which used small stocks. But there was no such thing as a small stock category or any kind of theoretical thinking around why that was a good idea. It just sort of was the more, the riskier end of the world. And that's what I did and that's what I had sort of grown up in my research activities. So why have you stuck with small cap well, as it, a focus? Well, it turned out it's very, very attractive area all the time. It turns out that it's an evergreen universe uh, with stocks always being introduced into the class. There's IPOs every year, in a good year, three or four hundred, in a bad year, a hundred, maybe. Uh, there are always spin-offs. There are always large companies falling down, becoming small companies. So there's lots of new material. It's a very big universe. It's thousands of companies, six, seven thousand companies. It's several trillion dollars worth of merchandise. So it's big enough and it's evergreen. Now there is a perception, and you actually kind of just mentioned it, there is a perception that small cap is a risky category. Yes. How uh, risky and, and, is and, it? 
It's both true and untrue. The category itself is more volatile than large caps. There's no question about it. But a sort of carefully designed uh, way of looking at it can reduce volatility substantially. And I believe sort of with sort of proper understanding, you can select portfolios that will perform better than the universe with less volatility. And so, that's what we try to do. So let's talk about that because in fact, that is something that you have done very successfully uh, for the last 35 years, is that you have beaten the market and with less volatility consistently over the long run. So how have you done that? I mean, how do you construct your portfolios to accomplish that? It is that old-fashioned word, a value approach. I, I don't happen to love the world word because it's sort of an overused word. It's kind of a cliche word. I prefer thinking of us as risk managers and that our idea is to reduce risk in a, any given stock and therefore reduce risk in the portfolio. Uh, and I truly believe you can do that within this very, very large, much more volatile universe. You can select portfolios that will perform better with less risk. Can you give us a for instance of maybe choices that you've made recently? I mean, I mean, there are 500 some odd securities in the in your flagship Pennsylvania Mutual Fund. So, so how do you just well, when give we me an do example? It, we we are. There's probably more to it than just risk reduction. We are always thinking about sort of the uh, risk return ratio. We are absolute investors, not relative investors. So we're focusing on absolute returns, which would mean simply if we buy something, we expect to make a lot of money and in dollars, not just relative to an index. So that focus of absolute returns and then ultimately comparing the return to what we think is the risk we don't really know, um, is sort of the system. Now, there's nothing very unique about that. It's applying what I would call very uh, uh, standardized sort of logic to this volatile universe. But when you look at your, your record, mm -hmm. for instance, I, I, I remember there was a statistic about over five-year rolling averages or something that 80% of the time that you delivered better than 10% annualized returns. Yes. Uh, well, you know, you might be doing what everyone else is doing. Well, it, is a bull <laughs> it has been a bull market for most of the 35 years. I mean, although obviously we've had bear markets from time to time. But in general, we have done, you know, I don't know, 12, 14 percent for most of our funds over the course, over the lifetime of their funds. Um, it's been a good market. We've beaten the index. We, I do want to beat the index though with less risk, less volatility. Right. At the end of the day, you can measure the volatility and you can measure how you do in down markets. So we describe those down market periods and the goal is not to go down as much. Pretty simple. Um, now, in our stock selection though, obviously stock selection is the first part of constructing a portfolio, but we start with the risk end of things rather than the return end of things. So meaning? Meaning in a new idea, what, you know, what's the deal here? How can we lose money? We can lose money because the company has too much leverage. We could lose money because the, strategy, the business strategy is cuckoo. We could lose money that, because the management appears to be not consistent with what we want managing our company. So we could lose money in lots of ways. We think deeply about all the risk factors before we deal with the return factors. So in the process of selection, we're talking risk first, return second. If you eliminate or can understand what we believe to be the risk factors, we deal with the return factor. We want to make a lot of money. We want to double our money over three to five years. So we have a fairly high bar of what we want to achieve. And then we go ahead and do it and construct a portfolio. Obviously, there's portfolio risk too. So we want to be careful about concentration. We want to be careful about too much in any one industry. So we, we, we're thinking, I think, appropriately about the portfolio risk. But that comes after the stock risk. Looking at the small caps uh, this as, as a sector, for yes. instance, Small caps have outperformed large cap companies now for 
quite a long period of time. A while. Certainly the last decade right. was, was a dramatic outperformance. So, so, so how risky now is the small cap sector? Well, I, I think that that's probably the wrong question. The wrong question is, what will the returns be in the next 10 years? And who is likely to do better, large caps or small caps? If you want to, Thank I don't you know for, that that's a much better I don't question. think it's terribly <laughs> critical, though, as to who does better, really. But um, I, I think it is entirely possible we're going to have returns that will be in between the last decade and the prior decade. Prior decade was a hot decade, the 90s. Large cap did very well. Mm -hmm. There was a moment where S&P had 20% plus five-year returns towards the end of the decade. Completely the opposite took place the last decade. So we're going to be in between. We're going to be six to eight, six to nine percent returns in my judgment Total return. overall for the overall market. And I think small caps will be higher from time to time and lower from time to time. Large caps will do the same. There'll be much more rotation in this decade. The large cap champions are you know, waiting on the sidelines for, for their turn at bat. And I think it will happen certainly from time to time. A couple of themes, and, and you just mentioned one of them. Number one, that, that global is its core to investment success now. Yes. And, it, and I think a, a lot of us who aren't that familiar with, with smaller company um, stocks uh, basically don't realize that there is, I mean, it, it, is there a, a vast, you know, array of opportunities in international companies that, uh, as well as domestic ones that do business internationally? Yes, I believe there is. Mm -hmm. And I think that will be an evolving trend in the next 10 years. Uh, there are not many focused small cap non-U.S. funds. We're going to have three or four of them uh, where we just focus on the smaller companies in non-U.S. settings. Uh, I do believe that's going to be a very important, quite similar to the growth and attention to small caps here that took place over 30 years. Um, I can see that happening in the next 10 or 15 years abroad. The numbers are staggering, 30,000 smaller companies around the world, plenty of opportunity. We are just uh, beginning that process. Although we've been at it for five, eight years, we're really um, just beginning to sort of build our expertise in that. Where are you finding the, the best opportunities? I mean, are there particular countries that happen to be you we, know, more we spent, friendly we, we didn't to small do businesses? That from a top-down basis. There are people that believe you start at the top with currencies and look at the countries, et cetera. We did from the bottom right. up. We did it stock by stock. And we picked Europe really first because we had uh, some folks that were uh, very knowledgeable about Europe. And we were lucky enough to trip across a couple people that now work for us full time that had a Europe-centric background. So we started with Europe. We've been very pleased with how that went. We have a European small cap fund that's three or four years old that's done quite well. We've stuck to our own basic plain vanilla, risk aversion, margin of safety, great balance sheet, higher quality company themes in Europe. And um, now we're doing the same thing in Asia. When you look at a, a small company, no matter where it is, how important is it if they are doing business globally? Well, uh, does that in, matter? In our, a lot? in our own universe, in U.S. companies, we do favor companies that have a global reach. No question, and we have plenty of those. Um, abroad, we're very interested in, of course, their business strategy. At the end of the day, I'm a nut on strategy, and you know, does it make sense, and how does it work, and you know the business model of, of just how do they address their market. And I can probably better relate to companies who have a global reach than have a local reach. But we do companies with local understandings also. I know you don't like to talk about individual stocks, but are there examples that, that would be kind of emblematic of, the, of a Royce company? Sure. Let's do the global mm -hmm. thing. Um, we have always favored um, financial service companies, not banks. 
money managers would be a sort of classic element. We think we know something about money management. Mm -hmm. So it's easy to sort of apply our understanding of what a good money manager is. So in Asia, we have recently invested, last couple of years, in a firm called Value Partners that has a, we believe, the kind of scale and understanding of the market. They're in the mutual fund world. They're in the, they're going to be in some other worlds. They're going to be similar to our larger, they're going to have a brand. I like to think over time there'll be a fidelity of Asia. Um, Where are they based? They're based in Hong Kong, mm -hmm. uh, but very, very active or about to be active in China. Um, so we like that and have a substantial investment in many funds. We have it in our international funds and in some other funds. We've always liked stock exchanges. We have a large investment in the uh, major exchange in Canada, uh, Toronto Exchange, uh, who it's an interesting exchange because uh, Canada has such a natural resource background. They, you know, have natural resources everywhere from right. oil to gold to everything. And in a sense, it's an indirect play on the whole uh, raising capital in the natural resource zone. Uh, exchanges, if properly constructed, can be very profitable enterprises. And so we like that one. They're both examples of financial service company. That's been an ongoing theme in the whole firm. Uh, domestically, we've owned many financial service companies and believe that's a, uh, a great sort of non-asset intensive way to play what's going on in the world. Your average holding period is? Forever would be the <laughs> preferred answer. Uh, it doesn't work out that way, but we own. We try to own. When we are looking at a company, we are looking as if we might hold it forever. It doesn't work out that way. So you're investing in a business. In a business. We are buying a business. In our, in our most basic valuation tools, we're thinking as if we bought the whole company. Uh, so the average holding period ends up to be four or five years. Average turnover, twenty-five percent. And, and what makes you sell a stock? Well, when something goes, first place, it could get so out of line from a valuation standpoint that that would be one. But probably the more typical reason is the strategy goes off kilter, that we begin to question certain things. When we get involved in a company, it takes a long time to build confidence in a in an investment. So we are very gradual and slow about building a, a commitment to a company. And the same way with, with thinking about the time to exit. Uh, but as we notice things, as we might do more data point checks, as we check with more customers, as we check with more competitors, et cetera, we might discover that some of our premises, some of our hope were misplaced. So we change our mind from time to time. So that accounts for turnover. Let me ask you about some other themes. And, and, and one of them is, I know that, that we've, and again, telling, uh, talking to you in a, at earlier, uh, that, that the, the last couple of years it's been kind of you know, high beta stocks, the, the riskier mm -hmm. stocks that have done incredibly well. And you think we're now in a period where quality is going to really count. Yeah, well, I hope so. Uh, it hasn't quite happened that way. Uh, the first year and a half, you know, from the from the late spring of '09 till now, has been you took the riskiest bets, you got the highest return, um, and that has been across the board. From the bottom, the riskier funds. We have a few in the higher risk zone have done very well, up 150% or so or more. Um, and uh, that's just been the nature of the market so far. But I do believe we're entering in a second phase and that as the economy accelerates, the markets will kind of decelerate. Um, and that in this sort of deceleration, I see quality dividend-oriented stocks doing much better as leaders and the higher risk stocks 
not doing as well. You told me dividends are king. Mm -hmm. As you said, cash right. used to be king, but now dividends well, I are think king. It's the same story. Mm -hmm. Dividends are going to be king. In, in dividend paying stocks, I think, are going to be very important ways of compounding wealth in the next decade. And I think dividends are critical. I've begun to think that dividends are actually a form of corporate governance that I want to see. That if I see a company generating cash and they're not paying dividends, I want to know why. The cash belongs to us, the shareholder, and we want a sort of fair treatment over time, a fair distribution of that. And a company that's always husbanding cash, and there's obviously a purpose for having some of that because of you know, opportunities, probably is not you know, fairly recognizing the, the sort of uh, fiduciary role that we should have as shareholders. But why do you feel so strongly about that now? Is that something new for you, this emphasis on dividends? Well, it, it is, in some sense, it's a product of sort of two things. One is, I think we're in a lower return period, six to eight percent or so for this decade. In a six to eight percent decade, having a couple percent in the bank day one is 25 percent home. Even though these numbers are small, I think that really adds to your safety. It's a form of risk management, you, you probably are adding to a, a less volatile enterprise, and it's a, it's a way of you know, getting ahead first. So I, I li just like that zone a lot. It's also an indicator of quality. And almost always, it's a higher quality company paying out dividends. You were kind enough to give us some examples as far as the global Reach. So, can, are there, can you give me some examples again that, that represent what Royce invests in as, as far as a company that pay, is paying dividends? Sure, sure. And responsibly. Most of our high quality companies pay dividends. So, the examples that we gave before of, of global companies, they both pay dividends. Mm -hmm. In the case of just dividend pay that have also other unique features, I can give you two good examples. One is a financial services company the wonderful company Federated Investors that runs money market funds around in the United States, they pay a, a reasonable dividend and um, I think will benefit terrifically by higher interest rates to come. Um, so that's a, that's a great example of, of what we're looking for where we're getting both. You manage 10 funds and, and, and you assist on several others. Do you have a favorite? I mean, is, is there one that you'd say if you, know, if, if you had to buy one of the Royce funds, again, for the next two, three, four years, this is where you should be? Hmm. It, what, do I have a favorite child? Is yes, that, is the question. exactly. Right. For well, this particular moment in time. Yeah, I think a dividend-oriented approach, and, and we have a fund called Royce Dividend Value, I think will do quite well. It straddles the small in the mid-cap and it has a global reach. And it has a six or seven year record, and I think, it, I think it's about to shine. But honestly, it's a bad question in that, you know, when you have all your children lined up, you really can't put them in categories of who's, some of them are behaving well today, some of them are not behaving well. So you can't really <laughs> judge them the next two years about their behavior the last two years. And Chuck, final question, which we ask all of our guests on Wealth Track: If you had to choose one investment, and you can't recommend one of your own funds, one investment that we should all own some of in a long-term diversified portfolio, what would it be? That's always the $64 question. Uh, I, I think one should invest in a, a, a pool, not necessarily our pool, of dividend-paying stocks, and that you will sort of get the best, best of all worlds in that theme for the next three to five years. Chuck right, Royce right. from the Royce Funds, thank you so much for being here on Wealth Track. Thank you. You can see why Morningstar recently wrote that Royce & Associates is a fun boutique that grew without losing its soul. 
And on that lovely note, we will conclude this edition of WealthTrack. I hope you can join us next week when we will focus on avoiding retirees' greatest fear, running out of money. We will revisit our conversation with Kiplinger's insurance expert, Kim Langford, and New York Life's Retirement Income Security Chief, Chris Blunt. Until then, to watch this program again, please go to our website, WealthTrack.com, to see it as a podcast or streaming video. And while you are there, check out our new WealthTrack app so you can tune in on your smartphone or tablet wherever and whenever you choose. Thanks for watching and make the week ahead a profitable and a productive one. Additional funding provided by Loomis Sales, investors seeking exceptional opportunities globally, research affiliates, an efficient index for an inefficient market, Wintergreen, your home for global value, and Rosalind P. Walter. Thank <laughs> you.